Welcome. I'm here in this beautiful church, St. Ignatius of Antioch in New York City with Dr. Barbara Hanning to bring you a special program about the great early 17th century composer, Claudio Monteverdi. This is the first episode of our new series of programs about Monteverdi's world, which I call, You've Got Mail, <laughs> because we focus on several of Monteverdi's letters. Many of you are already familiar with some of Monteverdi's music, because it has been a, an important part of Artec's concert repertory and recordings. In these programs, we're going to try to have you also become familiar with the composer himself, his personality, his struggles, his triumphs, using his own words, as found in his letters, and through images of the people and places that surrounded him. Our hope is that you will come away with a new perspective about his life and times, and a deeper understanding and appreciation for his music. First, let me tell you about his birthplace. Monteverdi was born and raised in Cremona, a beautiful little city only second in importance to Milan in that region of northern Italy. The town is justifiably proud of its native son, so five years ago, it hosted an international conference of music historians to celebrate the 450th anniversary of Monteverdi's birth. These are some photos I took at the conference. This one is of the conference poster. And here's one showing how the town announced the week-long conference 
by projecting it onto the tower of the old town hall at night. And we were also treated to the nightly and, I must admit, somewhat ghostly appearance of Monteverdi's head looming over us from the tower. I took that shot of it with the moon beaming down on us. Cremona was also the center of instrument building in Italy, of organs and especially stringed instruments, both plucked and bowed. The most famous makers of instruments in the violin family during Monteverdi's lifetime were the Amati, and later the Stradivari. Yes, in fact, Antonio Stradivari was also a native son of Cremona, although he was born the year after Monteverdi died. The town still supports many luthiers shops. The center of musical life in Cremona was the cathedral, which dates from the 12th century. My photos don't do it justice, but you can see that its facade is in the Romanesque style and it has a famously tall bell tower. It looks deceptively small from the outside, but the interior is quite large and majestic. In Monteverdi's boyhood, the Maestro di Capella was Marc Antonio Ingenieri. Monteverdi probably sang in Ingenieri's cathedral choir, which was the typical way during the Renaissance that a youngster became a musician and composer. Ingenieri, who likely taught him theory and composition as well as singing, wrote sacred music in the style of the most prominent Renaissance church composer, Palestrina, but also composed in the most fashionable secular genre of the time, the Italian madrigal. At that time, the Archbishop of Milan was Cardinal Carlo Borromeo, who was a leader in the church's combat against the Protestant Reformation. So, Given the religious climate and Monteverdi's training as a choir boy, it was logical that at age 15, he should make his compositional debut with a collection of sacred and devotional works in Latin, the Sacre Cantiunculae, or Little Sacred Songs for Three Voices. Those were published in 1582. Yes, and the very next year, he brought out a set of spiritual madrigals for four voices. Madrigali Spirituali were written on Italian texts, just like regular madrigals, but they used sacred, moral, or devotional themes, which were very popular because they were in line with the movement of the Counter-Reformation. Cardinal Borromeo had actually inveighed against what he thought was the indecency of profane madrigals with their often racy lyrics that were all the rage at Italian courts. So the young Monteverdi took the safer course in presenting these spiritual madrigals. The following year, 1584, he produced the Canzonette for three voices, his first and only collection to have this title. And what's noteworthy is that some of the same poems in Monteverdi's collection had already been set by established composers. So it seems that at the age of 17, Monteverdi was signaling to his peers that he was ready to play with the big boys. But Monteverdi is known for his madrigals. Tell us more about those. Ah, you mean those more sophisticated and sensuous pieces with the literary pedigree that goes back to Petrarch? They had become the proving ground for composers in the last half of the 16th century, and Monteverdi brought out his first book in 1587, but it's difficult to say precisely when he started writing them because madrigal collections generally had about 20 pieces in a volume. So we can assume that Monteverdi probably spent most or all of those three years since his Canzonette publication choosing the madrigal texts and composing the music. We showed the title page of his first book, but let's also show people what a madrigal book looked like in those days. This is a facsimile of Monteverdi's Primo Libro. It actually had five separate smaller books, one for each voice part, the canto, alto, tenor, bass, and the quinto, the fifth part, which could be somewhere in the middle. And that's why they're called part books, as opposed to nowadays when madrigals are printed in score with the parts lined up on the same page, one under the other. There was not yet a sixth part book for the continuo, as some of the later collections had. This collection was, in effect, Monteverdi's first job application, his first attempt to leave Cremona, 
because it was dedicated to a count at the court of Verona. Significantly, Verona was the birthplace of his musical supervisor and mentor, Ingenieri, who still had connections there. So Monteverdi was probably hoping for a glowing recommendation. Monteverdi's second book of madrigals is again dedicated to someone outside of Cremona, a bigwig in Milanese circles who had apparently marveled at Monteverdi's playing on the viola during a visit the young man made to Milan. We know about this trip from his dedication to the second book, and it is the first mention of his proficiency as a string player. We can well imagine that he had transformed himself into an instrumentalist when his voice broke during puberty, and specifically into the sort of instrumentalist that his hometown, famed for its violin makers, was bound to nurture, that is, into a string player. Now this new collection, Monteverdi's Book Two from 1590, already exhibits a different kind of writing, closer to what we think of as Monteverdi's mature style, dazzling and coloristic, full of images, a kind of painting in sound. The poems in this collection are dominated by the famous mad poet Torquato Tasso, whose poetry Monteverdi later acknowledged to have had a great influence on him. By the time Monteverdi's third book of madrigals was published at age 22, he had already been employed for a couple of years in a new position and for a new boss as a string player, singer, and singing master in Mantua at the court of Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga. We know this from his dedication of Book Three to the Duke, in which he says, From that day, most serene prince, when to my rare good fortune I came to serve your highness, I have had no greater thought nor more anxious care than to act in such a way that you can see that you have not proffered your grace to a useless and lazy servant. For just as any plant produces fruit after flowers, so in my profession of music, I have provided you not only flowers, but these madrigals, which, being more permanent, more resemble fruit. It pleases me to hope that, just as the sun draws a plant's virtue from its roots into flowers, and from flowers into fruit, so your most serene highness, who are my son, produce in me effects such that if my skill flowered for you in playing the viola, with its fruits now maturing, my skill can more worthily and more perfectly serve you. Your Most Serene Highness, who are my son. Monteverdi's new employer then was this sunny guy, Vincenzo Gonzaga, fourth Duke of Mantua, who may have been immortalized centuries later by Giuseppe Verdi as the infamous womanizer of his opera Rigoletto. The real Duke was a complicated leader. On the one hand, Vincenzo wanted military glory and led three campaigns with dubious success in Hungary against the encroaching Ottoman Turks between 1595 and 1601. In fact, he dragged Monteverdi with him on the first campaign for five months on a journey for which Monteverdi later complained that his extra expenses were never reimbursed by the Duke. On the other hand, at home in Mantua, Vincenzo built and presided over a court culture that reached heights of unparalleled brilliance. In addition to musicians like Jacques de Verd, Benedetto Pallavicino, and the young Monteverdi, he recruited painters like Peter Paul Rubens and Franz Porbus the Younger. Porbus was the Flemish painter of the portrait of Vincenzo you saw a moment ago. He also sponsored staged entertainments supported poets like Tasso and Guarini, whose Pastor Fido was produced at court in 1598, and nurtured civic academies, such as the Invagiti, which was the organization responsible for the production of Monteverdi's first opera, L'Orfeo, in 1607. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In 1584, Vincenzo had married Eleonora de' Medici, sister of Marie de' Medici, and that cemented the relationship 
and probably fostered the rivalry with the splendid Medici court in Florence, where the very earliest operas were soon to be developed. Vincenzo and Eleonora had five children, most importantly Francesco and Ferdinando, their first two sons, who figure in Monteverdi's letters. You'll be hearing more about them during the course of these programs. In 1596, the Flemish composer Jacques de Verde, Vincenzo's longtime master di cappella, died, and Benedetto Pallavicino was appointed. Like Monteverdi, Pallavicino was from Cremona, but he was senior to Monteverdi in terms of age and service at the court, and had published several collections of madrigals. Monteverdi undoubtedly felt he was being overlooked, so he sent out feelers to another court, this time to Ferrara. Ferrara, that was the seat of the Este court, and Vincenzo's sister was married to Duke Alfonso d'Este, and the poet Tasso was also there. Yes, and later, Monteverdi intended to dedicate his fourth book of madrigals to Duke Alfonso. But because he had recently died, Monteverdi addressed the dedication to a Ferrarese academy instead. So you see his reputation was spreading to Ferrara and elsewhere, because it was often the case that madrigals circulated and were performed before they were actually collected into a set of part books and printed. Then, too, some were printed in anthologies with contributions by various composers. In fact, it was in Ferrara that Giovanni Maria Artusi heard those madrigals by Monteverdi, which triggered his polemic against the composer. But that's another story to be told in the next program of this series. Okay, now let's talk about Monteverdi's personal life. In 1599, Monteverdi married Claudia Cataneo, a singer at court and the daughter of one of his string playing colleagues. Their wedding took place in this modest little church of Saints Simon and Jude. Only a few weeks later, Monteverdi was required to leave his bride and accompany the Duke on a vacation to take the waters in Flanders, where Monteverdi undoubtedly gained new artistic experiences. In 1601, the couple's first son was born and baptized in the church where they had wed. They named him Francesco, after Prince Francesco Gonzaga, the Duke's firstborn, who stood as godfather. Also in that year, Benedetto Pallavicino died. He was the Duke's maestro di cappella, the one who succeeded Jacques de Vert. And Monteverdi lost no time in applying for the position with elaborate excuses for not having asked for the job earlier, when Wert had died. He was already director of the chamber ensembles, that is, Maestro di Camera, but not yet of the chapel, Maestro di Capello. Here we have a young, ambitious musician, anxious to make his mark as a composer in a famous ducal court. This is what Monteverdi's resume, so to speak, would have looked like in 1601. Monteverdi's task in the first letter that survives from his hand that you are about to hear was essentially to write what we would now call a cover letter for his application to the position. Our text singer, Ryland Angel, will now read Monteverdi's letter together with a modern take on his words. Mantua, 28th of November, 1601, to Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga at Canissa, Hungary. Most serene Lord, my most respected master, if I did not hasten to ask personally of your Highness's good grace on this occasion of Pallavicino's death, for the musical appointment which Signor Giacchez formerly had, perhaps Envy in the designs of others might, to my detriment, use such obvious ploys more akin to rhetoric than music, that tating your highness's good will towards me, they could give you to believe that this arose from some fear of my incapacity, or even from some excessive self-assurance. And therefore, I was waiting ambitiously for what, unworthy servant that I am, I should have affectionately requested 
and sought out with special humility. Dear Sir, a musical establishment of your court has become famous through the music of Mr. Verd, Mr. Rovigo, and Mr. Strigio. Recently, I understand that because of the passing of Mr. Pallavicino, who did his best to compose on the level of his predecessors, the position of director of music of both the court and chapel is open. I know you will be eager to fill this position as soon as possible. Furthermore, if I did not also try to seize the chance of serving your highness as often as an occasion presents itself, you would have particular reason to complain justly of my negligent service. And similarly, my poor knowledge not seeking to good ends, greater opportunity for showing itself to your most refined musical taste as of some worth in motets and masses too, you would have just cause to complain of me. I would very much like to apply for this position. I have been working as a member of your court orchestra with great success for over 10 years. And I have also been composing as well during this time with several volumes of published works already under my belt. And I'm completely equipped to provide masses and vespers music for the chapel, madrigals for the court's regular pleasure, and theatrical music for the special events of your court, such as weddings, funerals, etc. And finally, the world having seen me persevere in your highness's service with much eagerness on my part, and with good grace on yours. After the death of the famous Signor Strigio, and after that of the excellent Signor Giacchez, and again a third time, after that of the excellent Signor Franceschino, and again lastly, after this of the competent Messer Benedetto Palevicino, could with reason murmur of my negligence if, not because of my skill, but because of the loyal and singular devotion I have always maintained in regard to your highness's service. I did not once more seek the position, now vacant in this quarter of the church, and did not, in all respects, ask most eagerly and humbly for the aforementioned title. My goal would be to equal, if not surpass, the achievements of Mr. Verd, Mr. Rivigo, and Mr. Strigio, for which I feel I am uniquely qualified as simply the best composer you could find anywhere. For all the above reasons then, and perhaps for those which to my good fortune your kindness could add since you have never disdained to hear my humble compositions, I ask beseechingly to be director of music, both of the chamber and of the church, which post, if your kindness and grace will so honour me, I shall receive with a humility that befits a feeble servant when he is encouraged and favoured by a great prince as is your highness to whom I bow and make a most humble reverence, daily praying God for the greatest contentment that a devoted and loyal servant can most affectionately wish his Lord. Your most serene highness's most humble and most grateful servant, Claudio Monteverdi. In short, I would be a tremendous asset to your court, and I assure you that you may have every confidence in me as your new director of music. I look forward to hearing from you. Sincerely, Claudio Monteverdi, composer and virtuoso in residence. 
One way a composer proved his abilities was to invite his work to be compared with other composers by setting the same poem. So in a moment, we will hear three settings of the same magical text, Cruda Amarini, by three different composers associated with Mantua, Vert, Pallavicino, and Monteverdi, as recorded by Arte. Monteverdi might have written his setting of Cruda Amarini as early as 1600, intending to call attention to himself as a worthy successor of Vert and Pallavicino. And we think that's when his critic Artusi heard it in Ferrara and caused the controversy that we will discuss next time. When Monteverdi published his fifth book in 1605, he gave Cruda Marili a place of honor by putting it first at the head of the collection, as if to say, remember this? It made quite a stir because it was so much better than other settings. Cruda Marili, Cruel Amaryllis, is from Guarini's pastoral play, The Faithful Shepherd, which was produced at court in 1598. But we don't know whether any of these settings were written for that occasion. The words are given to Mirtillo, the character in love with Amarilli, but initially she doesn't pay any attention to him. So this madrigal expresses his complaint about being rejected. Guarini's lyrics had enormous appeal for composers because they were witty and sensuous full of extreme sentiments and exaggerated exclamations, but also very clever. He exploited puns and antitheses that allowed composers to use color and contrast. So for example, at the poem's opening, Guarini puns on the name Amarilli because amare as a verb means to love, but as an adjective, amare means bitter. So he suggests the duality of love and hate or sweetness and bitterness. The rest of the poem proceeds with similar pairs of contrasts or antitheses. Mirtillo describes Amarilli's paradoxical qualities. She is both more beautiful and more pure than the white privet flower, but deafer to his pleas and more elusive than a snake. And finally, he lays out his own inner conflict. He can either offend her by speaking or die in silence. Today, Vert is revered as one of the finest madrigal composers of the Renaissance, whereas Pallavicino has faded into obscurity. Monteverdi also seemed to have a low opinion of Pallavicino. You can judge their relative merits for yourselves. All three composers of Cruda Marilli model their music closely on the meaning of the words. This is very evident, for example, when they all use simple chordal harmonies to convey Amarilli's pureness and beauty. And in the next moment, when she is described as elusive or fleeting, they quicken the rhythms on the word fugace, fleeting. But there are also subtle differences in their treatment of the text. Wert's setting captures Mirtillo's doleful complaint at the very beginning, as his cry of Cruz Amarilli echoes in all the voices and the ending with Mirtillo's invocation of his dying in silence is a long drawn out affair where Vert portrays Mirtillo's exquisite pain in descending chromatic tones. Interestingly, the music of the last two lines of the poem takes up almost half the madrigal in Vert's setting, which may be the composer's way of saying that this shepherd lad is prone to exaggerating his feelings and doth protest too much.
Pallavicino's setting opens with a series of audacious harmonies that make Mirtillo seem perhaps a little distraught or beside himself. And at the end, he cleverly translates the antithesis that Guarini set up, if I offend you by speaking, then I shall die in silence. He translates that into contrasting musical ideas, the first one rising and the other falling, and then plays with them repeatedly to drive the point home and bring the piece to a satisfying conclusion.
Finally, Monteverdi's setting takes many of the same ideas that his predecessors used, but he intensifies them. So the dissonances of his opening phrases really portray how harsh Mirtillo thinks Amarillos is behaving towards him, and how true she is to the part of her name that implies bitterness. Then listen to how Monteverdi dramatizes the phrase about her elusiveness. All the voices sing together, a più fugace, più fugace, and come to a sudden stop. She's disappeared. At the end, like Pallavicino, he lays out Mirtillo's conflict about whether to speak the truth or die in silence by contrasting two different musical ideas, one falling, the other rising. But then he complicates things by combining them so that while one voice sings the rising motive, another sings simultaneously the falling one. The effect is that the contrast is not just between this and that, but we realize that the conflict is within Mirtillo himself, and it's tearing him apart. The next letter was written after a lapse in Monteverdi's correspondence of several years, that is, in 1607. It was addressed to the Duke's counselor, who was the go-between for Monteverdi and Duke Vincenzo, and the letter enclosed a new madrigal the Duke had asked for. Monteverdi had retreated to Cremona. He was exhausted from having written Orfeo, his first opera, which occupied him for almost an entire year, and was feeling as he puts it, a little indisposed. So he was apologetic about not having sent a second piece that he was still working on, but promised it would soon be finished. Cremona, 28th of July, 
tu Annibale Iberti at Genoa, my most illustrious lord and most respected master. As soon as his highness left Mantua, I too went away to see my father in Cremona, where I still am, which is why I did not receive your lordship's letter earlier than the 20th of this month. And so, on seeing His Highness's commission, I straightway began setting the sonnet to music, and was engaged in doing this for six days. Then two more, what with trying it out and rewriting it. I worked at it with the same devotion of mind that I have always had in regard to every other composition written by me in order the more to serve His Highness's most delicate taste. But I did not work with comparable physical strength, because I was a little indisposed. Nevertheless, I hope that this madrigal is not going to displease His Highness. But if by chance, to my misfortune, it were to obtain an unfavourable result, I beg your Lordship to tender my apology based on the above-mentioned reason. Here, then, is the music I have composed, but you will be doing me a kindness by handing it over, before His Highness hears it, to Signor Don Bassano, so that he can rehearse it and become familiar with the music together with the other gentlemen singers, because it is very difficult for a singer to perform a part which he has not first practised, and greatly damaging to the composition itself, as it is not completely understood on being sung for the first time. I shall send your lordship the other sonnet, set to music, as soon as possible, since it is already clearly shaped in my mind. But. If I should tarry even a little in His Highness's opinion, please be good enough to let me know, and I shall send it at once. And with this conclusion, making a humble reverence to your Lordship, and praying that you may count me among your servants, I pray our Lord for your every happiness your most illustrious Lordship's devoted servant, Claudio Monteverdi. Monteverdi mentions his music in this letter twice. First, when he talks about setting a sonnet to music, and secondly, when he talks about an all-male piece, since we know there were only male singers at court. We'd like to play for you now Monteverdi's Canzonetta for Men's Voices, Non voglio amare. We haven't talked about this type of piece yet. The canzonetta was also a part song, usually for three voices, but less sophisticated than the madrigal. It was very popular in tone and sometimes appealed by using dance rhythms. The words were usually by anonymous poets and always in strophic form, which means that the music was repeated for all stanzas and therefore not that closely wedded to the meaning of the words, because if the words change from one stanza to the next, but the same music is repeated, only a general feeling can be conveyed. Non voglio amare e non penare Amor seguendo Oh, 
one of Monteverdi's settings of a sonnet, Oime il Belviso, for five voices in continuo, from book six, which was his next publication after this letter. The sonnet, in contrast to the canzonetta, was a long-standing and highly regarded poetic form, going back several centuries to Petrarch and before. It had a strict rhyme scheme and a particular structure that directed, even dictated, the musical form which was always through composed, meaning it was different from beginning to end, and that gave a composer the freedom to craft the music to every nuance of the text, as we saw with Cruda Marilli. When Monteverdi was tasked with setting a sonnet to music, he consequently used his most artful musical vocabulary and took great care to express the meaning of the words. When he chose to set sonnets by Petrarch, like Oime il Belviso, some think he was also expressing his own most personal sentiments, especially because Petrarch's verse is very introspective. This madrigal opens with the lover's sigh, Oime, and that sigh sets a mood that permeates Monteverdi's entire setting.
In the next letter, written at the end of 1608, Monteverdi was much more specific about his complaints, maybe because the letter was addressed to one of the Duke's counselors, Anibale Chiepio, someone who was on Monteverdi's side and willing to intercede on his behalf. After knocking himself out again by collaborating in theatrical entertainments for the wedding festivities of Prince Francesco Gonzaga and Margarita of Savoy, writing more stage works, including his opera Ariana, a ballet and incidental music, he was back in Cremona and had suffered through a very difficult year personally. His wife Claudia had died, we don't know the cause, and a young pupil whom he had been training for the role of Ariana had contracted smallpox and also died. He himself was ill, suffering from migraines and probably shingles. He was being called back to Mantua, where he feared the bad air of the marshes would do him in. We have the independent testimony of his brother, Giulio Cesare, about Monteverdi's horrendous workload in Mantua, which involved, and I quote, not only his responsibilities for both church and chamber music, but also for other extraordinary services. He finds the greater part of his time taken up now with tournaments, now with ballets, now with comedies and various concerti, and lastly with the playing of the two viole bastardi, end quote. Let's hear now a letter of 1608, which seems to have been an even more difficult year for Monteverdi. Cremona, 2nd of December, 1608. My most illustrious lord and most esteemed master, Annibale Chieppo, counsellor to Duke Vincenzo. Today I received from your lordship a letter from which I learned of his highness's command that I come as soon as possible to Mantua and proceed to wear myself out again as he ordains. I assure you that unless I take a rest from toiling away at music for the theatre, my life will indeed be a short one, for as a result of my labours so recent and of such magnitude, I have had a frightful pain in my head and a terrible and violent rash around my waist. My father attributes the cause of the headache to mental strain and the rash to Mantua's air, which does not agree with me. If fortune favoured me last year by making the Lord Duke invite me to assist with the musical events for the marriage of Prince Francesco and Margarita of Savoy, 
It also did me a bad turn on that occasion, by making me perform an almost impossible task, and furthermore, it caused me to suffer from cold, lack of clothing, servitude, and very nearly lack of food through the stopping of my wife Claudia's allowance and the onset of a serious illness. I know full well that His Highness the Duke has the very best of intentions towards me, and I know that he is a very generous prince, but I am extremely unlucky at Mantua, for I do know that His Highness, after the death of my wife Claudia, made a resolution to leave me her allowance. However, on my arrival in Mantua, he suddenly changed his mind and thus gave no such order to the paymaster. What clearer proof do you want, your lordship, to give two hundred scudi to Messer Marco da Galliano, who can hardly be said to have done anything, and to give me, for what I did, nothing? Therefore, I beg you for the love of God, knowing as you do that I am unwell and unfortunate in Mantua, please let me have an honourable dismissal from His Highness, for it seems to me that this is the best possible thing, because I shall have a change of air, work and fortune. Or, if worst comes to worst, I can remain as poor as I am. In closing, my heart and voice proclaim your infinite kindness and my everlasting indebtedness to your Lordship, to whom I bow and kiss your hands. Your most illustrious Lordship's ever most obligated servant, Claudio Monteverdi. The Florentine composer scornfully mentioned by Monteverdi was Marco da Galliano, who had made a splash in Mantua with his opera La Daphne. Monteverdi, the house composer, felt he was not being paid commensurate with his output compared to the visiting composer Galliano, who had received the equivalent of Monteverdi's entire annual salary for a mere two months' work, as he complains in the letter. That injustice was compounded by the fact that Galliano was 15 years younger than Monteverdi, or about 25 when he came to Mantua, whereas Monteverdi was already in his early 40s and feeling, well, pretty worn out. So you can understand why he might have been disgruntled by the presence of this young, hotshot composer. The story of Galliano's opera about Apollo and Daphne was itself an expansion of the first experimental opera in Florence, which was in turn partly reworked from a scene in the spectacular Medici wedding celebrations of 1589. We want to give you a taste of the kind of special festivities and music that Monteverdi and his contemporaries were tasked with writing. So here is an excerpt from Artec's 2016 performance of the 1589 Florentine Intermedi, in which we interpolated a scene from Galliano's Daphne, written later, into the third intermedio. Thank you. 
Now we have come to the point where I think I should introduce you to the Gonzaga sons, Francesco and Ferdinando. Remember Francesco? He was the firstborn of Duke Vincenzo, and I mentioned earlier that Monteverdi had named his own first son after him and asked that the family be honored by having the young Gonzaga become the infant's godfather. Until Francesco Gonzaga succeeded to the dukedom in 1612, he was known as Prince Francesco, and in the next letter, Monteverde refers to him as His Highness the Prince. Prince Francesco was very involved with cultural events at court. Most importantly, he encouraged the production of Orfeo in Mantua in 1607. So when it was published two years later, in 1609, Monteverde dedicated the work, his first opera, to him, as you can see on the title page. But it was Francesco's marriage to Margaret of Savoy the previous year that had occasioned the productions of Monteverdi's opera Ariana and other works by him that had so physically exhausted the composer and sent him back to his father's house in Cremona, which had become Monteverdi's protective cocoon. Ferdinando was the same age as Monteverdi. Typically for second sons, he was destined for a career in the church and was made a cardinal at age 20. But he was also a poet and composer and had collaborated with the Florentine composer Galliano on La Daphne. So you have Ferdinando, this second son, who favored the Florentines, and Francesco, the older son, who championed Monteverdi. Both brothers were members of the Accademia degli Invaghiti, a sort of aristocratic gentleman's club that met in the Ducal Palace and its members made up the audience at the first performance of Orfeo, which was staged in a small room of the palazzo, probably the one called the Stanza della Musica that was shown to me and my colleagues during that conference that I told you about earlier, though its configuration has been much changed since the 17th century. At the beginning of 1607, Francesco, the dedicatee of Orfeo, wrote from Mantua to his brother in Pisa, which was in the Florentine orbit. I have decided to have a play in music performed at Carnival this year, but as we have very few sopranos here, and those few not good, I should be grateful if you would be kind enough to tell me if those castrati I heard when I was in Tuscany are still there. My intention is to borrow one of them for a fortnight at most, as long as you agree to ask the Grand Duke of Tuscany for me. And so it was that the Florentine singer, Giovanni Gualberti Magli, joined the cast of Orfeo as a soprano. The title role was played by the tenor Francesco Razzi, one of the singers of the Mantuan Ensemble, and the castrato Magli performed three other roles, including the prologue, which you are going to hear. But before that, let's listen to Monteverdi's letter from 1609 about Orfeo, it was addressed to Alessandro Strigio, court secretary and counselor, who was also the librettist of Orfeo and therefore a close collaborator of Monteverdi. Cremona, 24th of August, 1609. To Alessandro Strigio at Mantua. My most illustrious lord and esteemed master, I have received a letter from your lordship together with certain words to be set to music, as a commission from His Highness. I shall start to work on them as soon as possible. I thought first of setting these words for a solo voice, but if later on His Highness orders me to rearrange the air for five voices, this I shall do. I have nothing else to tell your Lordship except about Orfeo. I hope that tomorrow my brother will receive the finished publication from the printer, who will send it to him by the courier from Venice. And as soon as he receives it, he will have one copy bound and will give it to His Highness Prince Francesco. And when he does, so I beg your Lordship to put in a few words with the Prince, conveying to him the great desire I have in my heart to prove what a very devoted 
and very humble servant I am, and explaining that I give little to his highness, who deserves much, really because of lack of opportunity, rather than through any defect of spirit. On the same occasion, you will also be doing me a kindness by letting the said prince know that I have spoken to those cornet and trombone players, as he commissioned me to do, and that they told me they will come and serve his highness, but on two conditions. One, that they would like letters of request for wages that are due because they play in the castle at Cremona. And the other point is that the father and two sons who play all the wind instruments would each like 12 scudi a month. I objected to this at once and told them that his highness would go up to eight, with which, it seems to me, they should be contented. So with this I close, making a reverence to your lordship, and I beseech you to keep me in your good graces. Your most illustrious lordship's devoted servant, Claudio Monteverdi. We'll hear now the prologue from Artic's recording of Orfeo as sung by soprano Dana Hanchard.
the letter about Orfeo, Monteverdi mentions the cornet and trombone, or sequit players, whose instruments he uses extensively in the underworld sections of the opera. Here's one of the underworld symphonias. <laughs> Monteverdi's score for Orfeo is quite an original and powerful synthesis of elements drawn from everything that was happening in Monteverdi's musical world at the time. The new Florentine style of theatrical recitative, or speaking in song, that enabled these stage works to be performed with continuous music. That, combined with more traditional forms, like the madrigal, which influenced his setting of the choruses, and like the court ballet, because dance also played a role in the opera, and like the instrumental symphonie that had aroused such wonder in the intermedi and other types of court entertainments. Those must have inspired the very colorful symphonie in Orfeo that were performed by players readily available at the splendid Gonzaga court. Orfeo was just the first of several brilliant operas by Monteverdi, and the earliest opera by any composer to have earned a place in the modern repertory. And to close our musical selections, the final chorus and Moresca, or Moorish pantomime dance from Orfeo. <laughs> Grazie al frutto coglie